Hello, welcome to my recording of the great, great audiobook of Where the Red Fern Grows by Wilson Rawls. If you like this book and you need stuff to do with the book, teachers, head on over to my Teacher Pay Teacher store. It's just SWN, uh, the S, the letter WN, uh, and you'll find a whole lot of stuff over there like Google Forms and questions that go along with this book as well. So enjoy the story. Chapter 8 The day hunting season opened, I was as nervous as Sammy our house cat. Part of that seemingly endless day was spent getting things ready for the coming night. I cleaned my lantern and filled it full of oil. <clears throat> With hog lard, I greased my boots until they were as soft as a hummingbird's nest. I was grinding my axe when my papa came around. He smiled as he said, This is the big night, isn't it? It sure is, papa, I said. And I've waited a long time for it. Yes, I know, he said. I've been thinking. There's not too much to do around here during the hunting season. I'm pretty sure I can take care of things. So you just go ahead and hunt all you want to. Thanks, Papa, I said. I, I guess I'll be out pretty late at night, and I'll, I'll probably have to do a lot of sleeping in the daytime. Papa started frowning. You know, he said, your mother doesn't like this hunting of yours very much. She's worried about you being all out all by yourself. <clears throat> I can't see why Mama has to worry, I said. Haven't I been roaming the woods ever since I was big enough to walk? And I'm almost 14 now. I know, said Papa. It's all right with me, but women are a little different than men. They worry more. Now, just to be on the safe side, I think it'd be a good idea for you to tell us where you'll be hunting. Then if anything happens, we'll know where to look. I told Papa I would but I didn't think anything was going to happen. After Papa had left, I started thinking. He doesn't even talk to me like I was a boy anymore. He talks to me like I was a man. These wonderful thoughts made me feel just as big as our old red mule. I had a good talk with my dogs. Now, I've waited almost three years for this night, I said, and it hasn't been easy. I've taught you everything I know, and I want you to do your best. Little Ann acted like she understood. She whined and saved me a a wash job on my face old Dan he may have but he didn't act like it he just lay there in the sunshine all stretched out and limber as a rag during supper mama asked me if I was going to go hunt <clears throat> I'm not going far I said just down on the river I could tell mama was worried and it didn't make me feel too good Billy she said I don't approve of this hunting but it looks like I can't say no not after all you've been through getting your dogs and all that training Oh, he'll be all right, Papa said. Besides, he's getting to be a good-sized man now. Man? <clears throat> Mama exclaimed. Well, he's still just a little boy. You can't keep him a little boy always, Papa said. He's got to grow up someday. I know, but I don't like it. Not at all, and I can't help worrying. Mama, please don't worry about me, I said. I'll be all right. <clears throat> well, I've been all over these hills. You know that. Well, I know, she said. But that was in the daytime. I've never worried too much when it was daytime, but at night, that's different. It'll be dark and anything could happen. There won't be anything happen, I said. I promise I'll be careful. Mama got up from the table saying, Well, it's like I said, I can't say no and I can't help worrying. I'll pray every night you're out. The way Mama had me feeling, I didn't know whether to go hunting or not. <clears throat> Papa must have sensed how I felt. It's dark now, he said. And I do. I understand that these coons start stirring pretty early. You better get going, hadn't you? While Mama was bundling me up, Papa lit my lantern. He handed it to me, saying, <clears throat> I'd like to see a big coon skin on the smokehouse wall in the morning. The whole family followed me out on the porch. There we all got a big surprise. My dogs were sitting on the steps waiting for me. I heard Papa laugh. <laughs> Why, they know they're going hunting, he said. <laughs> know it as well as anything. Well, I never, said Mama. Do you really think they do? It looks like they do. Why, just look at them. The little Ann started wiggling and twisting. Old Dan trotted out to the gate, stopped, turned around, and looked at me. 
Sure they know my, Billy's going hunting, piped up the little one. And I know why. <clears throat> How do you know so much, silly? I asked the oldest one. Because I told little Ann that's why. She said, and she told old Dan that's how they know. <laughs> we all had to laugh at her. The last thing I heard as I left the house was the voice of my mother. Be careful, Billy, and don't stay out late. It was a beautiful night, still and frosty. A big grinning Ozark moon had the countryside bathed in soft yellow glow. The starlit heaven reminded me of a large blue umbrella outspread and with the handle broken off. <clears throat> Just before I reached the timber, I called the dogs to me. Now the trail will be a little different tonight, I whispered. It won't be a hide dragged on the ground. It'll be the real thing, so remember everything I taught you. And I'm depending on you. Just put one up a tree, and I'll do the rest. I turned them loose, saying, Go get them. They streaked for the timber. And by the time I had reached the river, every nerve in my body was drawn up as tight as a fiddle string. Big-eyed and with ears open, I walked on, stopping now and then to listen. The way I was slipping along, anyone would have thought I was trying to slip up on my coup myself. I had never seen a night so peaceful and still. All around me, tall sycamores gleamed like white streamers in the moonlight. A prowling skunk came wobbling up the river bank. He stopped when he saw me. I smiled at the foxfire glow on his small, beady red eyes. He turned and disappeared in the underbrush. I heard a sharp snap and a feathery rustle in some brush close by. A small rodent started squealing in agony. A nighthawk had found his supper. Across the river and... From far back in the rugged mountains, I heard the bang of a hound. I wondered if it was the same one I had heard from my window on those nights so long ago. Although my eyes were seeing the wonders of the night, my ears were ever alert, listening for the sound of my hounds telling me that they had found a trail. I was expecting one of them to bawl, <coughs> but when it came, it startled me. The deep tones of old Dan's voice jarred the silence all around me. I dropped my axe and almost dropped my lantern. A strange feeling came over me. I took a deep breath and threw it back, back my head to give the call of a hunter. But something went wrong. My throat felt like it had been tied in a knot. <clears throat> I swallowed a couple of times and the knot disappeared. As loud as I could, I whooped, Woo-wee! Get him, Dan! Get him! Little Ann came in. The bell-like tones of her voice made shivers run up and down my spine. I whooped to her, Woo-wee! Tell it to him, little girl! Tell it to him! This was what I had prayed for, worked and sweat for. My own little hounds, bawling on the trail of a river coon. I don't know why I cried, but I did. And while the tears rolled, I whooped again and again. They straightened the trail out and headed down the river. I took off after them as fast as I could run. A mile downstream, the coon pulled his first trick. And I could tell by my dog's voices that they had lost the trail. And when I came to them, they were out on an old drift, sniffing around. The coon had pulled a simple trick. He had run out on the drift and leaped into the water and crossed the river. And to an experienced coon hound, the crude trick would have been nothing at all. But my dogs were just big, awkward pups trailing their first live coon. I stood and watched, wondering if they would remember the training I had given them. Now and then I would whoop, urging them on. Old Dan was having a fit. He whined and he bawled. He whimpered and cried. He came to me and reared up, begging for help. I'm not going to help you, I scolded. And you're not going to find him on out that drift. If you would just remember some of the training I gave you, you could find the trail. Now go find that coon. He ran back out on the drift and started searching. Little Ann came to me. I could see the pleading in her warm gray eyes. I'm ashamed of you, little girl. I thought you had more sense than this. If you let him fool you this easily, you'll never be a coon dog. She whined, turned, and trotted downstream to search again for the lost trail. I couldn't understand... Had all the training I had given them been useless? I knew if I waded the river, they would follow me. Once on the other side, it would be easy for them to find the trail. I didn't want it that way. I wanted them to figure it out by themselves. The more I thought about it, the more disgusted I became. I sat down and buried my face in my arms. Out on the drift, old Dan started whining. <clears throat> it made me angry, and I got up to scold him again. I couldn't understand his actions. He was running along the edge of the drifts, whimpering and staring down river. I looked that way. I could see something swimming for the opposite shore. At first, I thought it was a muskrat. In the middle of the stream where the moonlight was the brightest, I got a good look. It was little Ann. With a loud whoop, I told her how proud I was. My little girl had remembered her training. <clears throat> she came out on the gravel bar. 
shook the water from my body, and disappeared in the thick timber. Minutes later, she let me know she had found the trail. Before the tones of her voice had died away, old Dan plowed into the water. He was so eager to join her, I could hear him whining as he swam. As soon as his feet touched the bottom of the shallows, he started bawling and lunging. White sheets of water knocked high in the moonlight by his churning feet gleamed like thousands of tiny white stars. He came out on the river onto a sandbar. In his eagerness, his feet slipped in the loose sand and down he went. He came out of his roll running and bawling. <laughs> Ahead of him was a log jam. He sailed over it and disappeared down the river bank. Seconds later, I heard his deep voice blend with sharp cries of little Ann. At that moment, no boy in the world could have been more proud of his dogs than I was. Never again would I doubt them. I was hurrying along, looking for the shallow riffle so I could wade across when the voices of my dogs stopped. I waited and listened. They opened up again on my side of the stream. The coon had crossed back over. I couldn't help smiling. I knew that never again would a ringtail fool them by swimming the river. The next trick the old fellow pulled was a dandy. <clears throat> he climbed a large water oak standing about 10 feet from the river and simply disappeared. I got there in time to see my dogs swimming the opposite shore. For half an hour they worked that bank, not finding the trail, they swam back. I stood and watched them. They practically tore the river bank to pieces looking for that trail. Old Dan knew the coon had climbed the water oak. He went back, reared up on it, and bawled a few times. There's no use in doing that, boy, I said. I know he climbed it, but he's not there now. Maybe it's like Grandpa said. He just climbed right on out the top and disappeared in the stars. My dogs didn't know it, but I was pretty well convinced that that was what the coon had done. <coughs> they wouldn't give up. Once again, they crossed over to the other shore. It, it was no use. The coon hadn't touched that bank. They came back. Old Dan went up to the river, and Little Ann worked downstream. An hour and a half later, they gave up and came to me begging for help. <coughs> I knelt down between their wet bodies. While I scratched and petted them, I let them know that I would still love them. I'm not mad, I said. I know you did your best. If that coon can fool both of us, then we're just beat. We'll go someplace else to hunt. He's not the only coon in these bottoms. And just as I picked up my axe and lantern, little Ann let out a ball and tore down the riverbank. Old Dan was with a bewildered look on his face. He stood for a moment looking at her, <clears throat> then raising his head high in the air, he made it my eardrums ring with his deep voice. I could hear the underbrush popping as he ran to join her. I couldn't figure out what had taken place. <clears throat> Surely little Ann had heard or seen something. I could tell by their voices that whatever it was they were after, they were close enough to see it and were probably running by sight. The animal left the bottoms and headed for the mountains. Whatever it was, it must have realized my dogs were crowding it a little too closely. At the edge of the foothills, it turned and came back toward the river. I was still trying to figure out what was going on when I realized that I was on striking the river, the animal had turned <clears throat> again and was coming straight toward me. I set my lantern down and tightened my grip on the axe. I was standing my ground quite well when visions of bears, lions, and all kinds of other animals started flashing across my mind. I jumped behind the big sycamore and was trying hard to press my body into the tree when a big coon came tearing by. Twenty-five yards behind him came my dogs running side by side. I saw them clearly when they passed me, bawling every time their feet touched the ground. After seeing that there was nothing to be scared of, once again I was the fearless hunter, screaming and yelling and as loud as I could, Get them, boy! Get them! I tore out after them. The trails I knew so well were forgotten. I took off straight through the brush. I was tearing my way through some elders when my voices and my dogs stopped. Holding my breath, I stood still and waited. Then it came, the long, drawn-out ball of the tree bark. My little hounds had done it. They had treed their first coon. Burr! 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 When I came to them and saw that they had done, I was speechless. I groaned and closed my eyes. I, I didn't want to believe it. There were a lot of big sycamores in the bottoms, but the one in which my dogs had treed... He was the giant of them all. <clears throat> While pl prowling the woods, I had seen the big tree many times. I had always stopped and admired it. Like a king in its own domain, it towered far above the smaller trees. It had taken me quite a while to find a name suitable for the big tree. For a while, I had called it the chicken tree. In, so in some ways, it reminded me of a mother hen hovering over her young in a rainstorm. 
Its huge limbs spread out over the small birch, ash, box elder, and water oaks as if it were alone were its protector. <clears throat> Next, I named it the Giant. Well, that name didn't last long. Mama told us children a story about a big giant that lived in the mountains and eight little children that were lost. Right away, I started looking for another name. And one day, while lying in the warm sun, staring at its magnificent beauty, I found the perfect name. From that day on, it was called the Big Tree. I named the bottoms around it the Big Bottoms, the Big Tree Bottoms. Walking around it, I, <clears throat> using the moon as a light, I started looking for the coon. High up in the top, I saw a hollow in the end of a broken limb. I figured that was where was the coon's den. I could climb almost any tree I'd ever seen, but I knew I could never climb the big sycamore, and it would take days to chop down. There had been very little hope <clears throat> from the beginning, but on seeing the hollow, I gave up. Come on, I said to my dogs. There's nothing I can do. We'll go someplace else and find another coon. I turned to walk away. <clears throat> My hounds made no move to follow. They started whining. Old Dan reared up, placing his front paws on the trunk. He started bawling. I know he's there, I said, but there's nothing I can do. I can't climb it. Well, it's 60 feet up in the first limb, and it would take me a month to cut it down. Again, I turned and started on my way. A little ant came to me. She reared up and started licking my hands. Swallowing the knot in my throat, I said... <clears throat> I'm sorry, little girl. I want him just as badly as you do, but there's no way I can get him. She ran back to the tree and started digging in the soft ground close to the roots. Well, come on now, I said in a gruff voice. You're both acting silly. You know I'd get the coon for you if I could, but I can't. With a whip dog look on her face and with her tail between her legs, little Ann came over. She wouldn't even look at me. Old Dan walked slowly around the big tree and hid himself. He peeped around the big trunk and looked at me. The message I read in his friendly eyes tore my heart. He seemed to be saying, <clears throat> But you told us to put one in a tree, and that you'd do the rest. Uh, with tears in my eyes, I looked again at the big sycamore. A wave of anger came over me. Gritting my teeth, I said, I don't care how big you are, I'm not going to let my dogs down. I told them if they put a coon in that tree, <clears throat> I'd do the rest, and I'm going to do that. I'm going to cut you down. I don't care if it takes me a whole year. I walked over and sank my axe as deep as I could in the smooth white bark. My dogs threw a fit. Little Ann started run, turning in circles. <clears throat> I can hear her pleased, whimpering cry. Old Dan bawled and started gnawing on the big tree's trunk. At first it was easy, my axe was sharp and the chips flew. Two hours later things were a little different. My arms felt like two dead grapevines and my back felt like someone had pulled a plug on one end of the, and drained all the sap out. And while taking a breather I saw I was making more progress than I thought I would. The cut I had started was a foot deep, but I still had a long way to go. Sitting on their rears, my dogs waited and watched. I smiled the look on their faces. Every time I stopped chopping, they would come over. While little Ann washed the sweat from my face, old Dan would inspect my work. He seemed to be pleased with what he saw, for he always wagged his tail. <clears throat> Along about daylight, I got my second win, and I really did make the chips a fly. This burst of energy cost me dearly. By sunup, I was so stiff I could hardly move. My hands and arms were numb. My back screamed with pain. I could go no further. Sitting down, I leaned back against the big tree and fell asleep. Little Ann woke me up by washing my face. I groaned with the torture of getting to my feet. Every muscle in my body seemed to be tied in a knot. <clears throat> I was thinking of going down to the river to wash my face in the cool water when I heard a, a loud whoop. I recognized my father's voice. I whooped to let him know where I was. Whoop! <clears throat> Papa was riding a red mule. After he rode up, he just sat there and looked at me. He glanced at my dogs and at the big sycamore. I saw the worry leave his face. He straightened his shoulders, pursed his lips, and blew out a little air. <sighs> he reminded me of someone who just dropped a heavy load. <clears throat> In a slow, calm voice, he asked, Are you alright, Billy? Yes, Papa. I'm just a little tired and sleepy, otherwise I'm fine. <clears throat> He slid down from the mule's back and came over. Well, your, your mother's worried, he said. When you didn't come in, we didn't know what had happened. You should have come home. I didn't know what to say. I, 
I bowed my head and looked at the ground. I was trying to, hard to choke back the tears when I felt his hand on my shoulder. I'm not scolding, he said. We just thought maybe you had an accident or something. I looked up and saw a smile on his face. He turned again and looked at the tree. Say, this is the sycamore you call the big tree, isn't it? I nodded my head. <clears throat> is there a coon in it, he asked. There sure is, Papa. He's in the hollow limb, see? That one way up there. That's why I couldn't come home. I'm a f I was afraid he'd get away. Maybe you just think he's there, Papa said. I believe I'd make sure before I cut down a tree that big. Oh, he's there all right, I said. My dogs weren't ten feet behind him when he went up it. <sighs> why are you so determined to get this coon, Papa asked. Couldn't you just go somewhere else and tree one? Maybe the tree would be a smaller one. I thought about that, Papa, but I made a bargain with my dogs. I told them that if they would put one in a tree, I'd do the rest. Well, they fulfilled their part of the bargain. Now it's up to me to do my part, and, and I'm going to, Papa. I'm going to cut it down. I don't care if it takes me a year. Papa laughed and said, Oh, I don't think it'll take that long, but it will take a while. I'll tell you what. You know what I'll do. You take the mule and you go get some breakfast. I'll chop on it until you get back. No, Papa, I said. I don't want any help. I want to cut it down all by myself. You see, <clears throat> if someone helps me, I, I wouldn't feel like I kept my part of the agreement. An astonished look came over my father's face. Why, well, Billy, he said. You can't stay down here without anything to eat and no sleep. Besides, it'll take at least two days to cut that tree down, and, and that's hard work. Please, Papa, I begged. Don't make me quit. I just have to get that coon. If I don't, my dogs won't ever believe in me again. Papa didn't know what to tell me. He scratched his head, looked over to my dogs and back at me. He started walking around, and I waited for him to make up his mind. He finally reached a decision. Well, all right, he said. <clears throat> if that's the way you want it, I'm for it, even if it is only an agreement between you and your dogs. If a man's word isn't any good, he's no good himself. Now, I have to get back and tell your mother that you're all right. It's a cinch that you can, can't do that kind of work on an empty stomach, so I'll send your oldest sister down with a lunch bucket. <clears throat> with tears in my eyes, I said, Tell Mom I'm sorry for not coming home last night. Nah, don't bother worrying about your mother, he said as he climbed on the mule's back. I'll take care of her. Another thing, <clears throat> I have to make a trip to the store today, and I'll talk this over with your grandfather. He may be able to help in some way. After Papa left, things were a little different. The tree didn't look as big, and my axe wasn't as heavy. I even managed to sing a little as I chopped away. When my sister came with the lunch bucket, I could have kissed her, but I didn't. She looked one, <clears throat> took one look at the big tree, and her blue eyes got as big as a guinea egg. You're crazy, she gasped. Absolutely crazy. Why, it'll take a month to cut that tree down, and all for an old coon. I was so busy with the fresh side pork, fried eggs, and hot biscuits, I didn't pay much attention to her. After all, she was a girl, and girls don't think like boys do. <coughs> she raved on. You can't possibly cut it down today, and what are you going to do when it gets dark? <coughs> I'm going to keep right on chopping, I said. I stayed with it last night, didn't I? Well, I'll stay until I cut down. I don't care how long it takes. My sister got upset. She looked at me, threw back her small head, and looked up to the top of the big sycamore. You're as crazy as a bed bug, she said. Why, well, I never heard of such a thing. She stepped over in front of me and very seriously asked if, I could, if she could look in my eyes. Look in my eyes, I said. What do you want to do that for? I'm not sick. Yes, you are, Billy, <clears throat> she said. Very sick. Mama said when old man Johnson went crazy, his eyes turned green. I want to see if yours have. This was too much. If you don't get out of here, <clears throat> I shouted, you're going to get red instead of green, and I mean that. I grabbed up a stick and started toward her. Of course, I wouldn't have hit her for anything. This scared her, and she started for the house. I heard her saying something about an old coon as she disappeared in the underbrush. <clears throat> Down in the bottom of my lunch bucket, I found a neat little package of scraps for my dogs. While they were eating, I walked down to a spring and filled the bucket with cool water. <clears throat> the food did wonders for me. My strength came back. I spit on my hands and whistling a coon hunter's time tune, I started making the chips fly. The cut grew so big I could have laid down in it. I, I moved over to another side and started a new one. Once in a while I was taking a rest, old Dan came over to inspect my work. 
He hopped up in the cut and sniffed around. You better get out of there, I said. If that tree takes a notion to fall, it'll mash you flatter than a tadpole's tail. With a no-care look on his friendly face, he gave me a hurry-up signal and wag of his tail. Little Ann had dug a bed in a pile of dead leaves. She looked as if she were asleep, but I knew she wasn't. Every time I stopped swinging the axe, she would raise her head and look at me. Chapter 9 By late evening, the happy tune I had been whistling was forgotten. My back throbbed like a stone bruise. The muscles in my legs and arms started quivering and jerking. I couldn't gulp enough air to cool the burning heat in my lungs. My strength was gone. I could go no further. I sat down and called my dogs to me, and with tears in my eyes, I told them that I just couldn't cut the big tree down. I was trying hard to make them understand when I heard someone coming. It was Grandpa and his buggy. I'm sure no one in the world can understand a young boy like his grandfather can. He drove up with a twinkle in his eye and a smile on his whiskery old face. Hello! How are you getting along? He boomed. Not so good, Grandpa. I said, I don't think I can cut it down. It's just too big. I, I guess I'll have to give up. Give up? Grandpa barked. Now I don't want to hear you say that. No, sir. That's the last thing I want to hear. Don't ever stop anything you can't finish. I don't want to give up, Grandpa, I said. Uh, it's just too big and my strength's gone. I'm give out. Of course you are, he said. You've been going at it wrong. To do work like that, a fellow needs plenty of rest and food in his stomach. Well, how am I going to get that, Grandpa? I asked. I can't leave the tree, and if I do, the coon will get away. No, he won't, Grandpa said. That's what I came down here for. I'll show you how to keep that coon in that tree. He walked around the big sycamore looking up. He whistled and said, Boy, <laughs> this is a big one, all right. Yes, it is, Grandpa. It's the biggest one in the river's bottom. Grandpa started chuckling. <laughs> That's all right, he said. The bigger they are, the harder they fall. How are you going to make the coon stay in the tree, Grandpa? I asked. With a proud look on his face, he said, Well, that's another one of my coon hunting tricks. Learned it when I was a boy. We'll keep him there all right. Oh, I don't mean we can keep him there for always, but he'll stay for four or five days, that is. Until he gets so hungry, he'll just have to come down. I don't need that much time, I said. I'm pretty sure I can have it down by tomorrow night. Grandpa looked at the cut. I don't know, he said. Even though it is halfway down, you must remember you've been cutting on it half one night and one another day. You might make it, but it's going to take a lot of chopping. If I get a good night's sleep, I said, and a couple meals under my belt, I can do a lot of chopping. Grandpa laughed. <laughs> Speaking of meals, he said, your ma's having chicken and dumplings for supper now. We don't want to miss that, so let's get busy. What do you want me to do, Grandpa? I asked. Well, let's see. First thing we'll need is some sticks about five feet long. Take your axe, go over there in that cane break, and get a six of them. I hurried to do what Grandpa wanted all the time, wondering what in the world he was going to do. How could he keep a coon in the tree? When I came back, he was taking some old clothes from the buggy. Take this stocking cap, he said. Fill it with about half full of grass and leaves. And while I was doing this, Grandpa walked over and started looking up into the tree. You're pretty sure he's in that hollow limb, are you? He asked. He's there all right, Grandpa. There's no other place he could be. I've looked all over it, and there's no other hollow anywhere. Well, in that case, Grandpa said, we better put our man along about here. What man, Grandpa? I asked in surprise. The one we're going to make, he said. To us, it'll be a scarecrow, but to that coon, it'll be a man. Knowing too well how smart coons were, <clears throat> right away I began to lose confidence. I don't see how anything like that could keep a coon in a tree, I said. <clears throat> oh, it'll keep him there, all right, Grandpa said. Like I told you before, they're curious little devils. 
poke their, his head out of that hole and see this man standing there and he won't dare come down. It'll take him four or five days to figure out that it isn't a real honest goodness man. But by that time it'll be too late and we'll have his hide tacked on a smokehouse wall. The more I thought about it, the more I believed it. And then there was that serious look on Grandpa's face. That was all it took. I was firmly convinced. <laughs> I started laughing. The more I thought about it, the funnier it got. Great big laughing tears rolled down my cheek. <laughs> What's so funny? Grandpa asked. Don't you believe it'll work? <laughs> sure it'll work, Grandpa. I said, I know it will. I was just thinking those coons aren't as half as smart as they think they are, are they? And we both had a good laugh at this. With the sticks and some bailing wire, Grandpa made a frame that looked almost like a gingerbread man. On this, he put an old pair of pants and a red sweater. We stuffed the loose, flabby clothes with the grass and leaves, and he wired the stocking cap head in place and stepped back to inspect his work. Well, what do you think of it? he asked. Well, if it had a face, I said, you, you couldn't tell it from a real man. Yeah, we can fix that, Grandpa chuckled. He took a stick and dug some black grease from one of the hubcaps of the buggy. I stood and watched while he applied his artistic touch, and in the stocking cap head he made two mean-looking eyes and a crooked nose and the ugliest mouth I'd ever seen. Well, what do you think of that? he asked. Looks pretty good, huh? Laughing fit to kill and talking all the same time, I told him that I wouldn't blame the coon if he stayed in the tree until Gabriel blew his horn. He won't stay that long, Grandpa chuckled, but he'll stay long enough for you to cut that tree down. Well, that's all I want, I said. We better be going, Grandpa said. It's getting late and we don't want to miss up that supper. I was so stiff and sore he had to help me in to the buggy seat. I called to my dogs. Little Ann came, but not willingly. The whole Dan refused to leave the tree. Come on, boy, I coaxed him. Let's go home and get something to eat. I'll come back tomorrow. He bowed his head and looked the other way. Come on, I scolded. We can't sit here all night. This hurt his feelings. We, he walked around behind the big sycamore and hid. Well, I'll be darned, Grandpa said as he jumped down from the buggy. He knows that coon's there, and he doesn't want to leave it. You've got a good coon hound there, and I mean a good one. He picked up old Dan up in his arms and set him in the buggy. All the way home, I had to hold on to his collar to keep him from jumping out and going back to the tree. As our buggy wound its way up through the bottoms, Grandpa started talking. You know, Billy, he said, about this tree chopping of yours, I think it's all right. In fact, I think it would be a good thing if all young boys had to cut down a big tree like that once in their lives. <laughs> it does something for them. It gives them determination and willpower. That's a good thing for a man to have. It goes a long way in his life. The American people have a lot of it. They have proved that all down through history. But they could do with a lot more of it. I could see the, this determination and willpower that Grandpa was talking about very clearly. All I could see was a big sycamore tree, a lot of chopping, and the hide of a ringtail coon that I was determined to have. As we reached the house, Mama came out. Right away, she started checking me over. Are you all right? She asked. Sure, Mama, I said. What makes you think something's wrong with me? Well, I don't know, she said. The way you acted when you got down from the buggy, I thought maybe you were hurt. Oh, he's just a little sore and stiff from all that chopping, Grandpa said. But he'll be all right. That soon go away. After Mama saw that there were no broken bones or legs chopped off, she smiled and said, I never know anymore. I guess I'll just have to get used to it. Papa hollered from the porch. Come on, we've been waiting supper on you. We're having chicken and dumplings, Mama beamed, and I cooked them especially for you. <clears throat> During the meal, I told Grandpa I didn't think that the coon in the big tree was the same one the dogs had been trailing at first. What makes you think that? he asked. I told how the coon had fooled us and how little Ann had seen or heard his other coon. I figured he was, he just walked up on my dogs before he realized it. A smile spread over my Grandpa's face. Chuckling, he said, It does look that way, but it wasn't. No, Billy, it was the same coon. They were much too smart to ever walk up on a hound like that. He pulled a trick, and it was a good one. In fact, it'll fool nine out of ten dogs. Well, what did he do, Grandpa? I asked. I I'm pretty sure he didn't cross the river, so how did he work it? Grandpa pushed the dishes back, and using his fork as a pencil, he drew an imaginary line on the tablecloth. It's called a backtracking trick, he said. Here's how he worked it. He climbed that water oak, but he went up about 15 or 20 feet. He then turned around and came down in the same tracks. He backtracked on his original trail for a way. 
and when he heard your dogs a-coming, he leaped far up on the side of the nearest tree and climbed up. He was in that tree all the time your dogs were searching for the lost trail. After everything had quieted down, he figured that they'd given up. That's when he came down, and that's when little Ann either heard or saw him. Pointing the, for pointing the fork at me, Grandpa said very seriously, You mark my word, Billy. In no time at all, that little Ann will know every trick a coon can pull. You know, Grandpa, I said, she wouldn't bark treat at the water oak like old Dan did. Of course she wouldn't, he said. She knew he wasn't there. Well, I never heard of such a thing, Mama said. I had no idea coons were that smart. Why, for all anyone knows, he, he may not have been in the big tree at all. Maybe he pulled another trick. It'd be a shame if Billy cut it down and found there was no coon in it. Oh, he's there, Mama, I hastily replied. I know he is. They were right on his tail when he went up. Besides, little Ann was bawling her head off when I came to them. Of course he's there, Grandpa said. They were crowding him too closely. He didn't have to pull another trick. Grandpa soon left soon after supper, saying to me, I'll be back down in a few days, and I want to see that coon hide. I thanked him for helping me and walked to, out to the buggy with him. Oh, I almost forgot, he said. I heard there's a fad back in the New England state. Seems like everyone is going crazy over coonskin coats. Now, if this is true, I look for the price of coon hides to take a jump. I was happy to hear this and told my father what Grandpa had said. Papa laughed and said, Well, if anyone can keep the coons out of those big sycamores, you might make a little bit of money. Before I went to bed, Mama made me take a hot bath. Then she rubbed me all over with some liniment that burned like fire and smelled like civet cat. It seemed like I had barely closed my eyes when Mama woke me up. Breakfast is re about ready, Billy, she said. I was so stiff and sore I had trouble putting my clothes on. Mama helped me. Maybe you'd better let that coon go, she said. I don't think he's worth all this. I can't do that, Mama, I said. I've gone too far now. Papa came in from the barn. What's the matter? You a little stiff? A little stiff, Mama exclaimed. Why, he could hardly put his clothes on. Oh, he'll be all right, Papa said. If I know anything about swinging an axe, it won't be long before he's as limber as a rag. Mama just shook her head and started putting our breakfast on the table. While we were eating, Papa said... You know, I woke up several times last night, and each time I was sure I heard a hound bawling. <laughs> it sounded like old Dan. I quit the table on the run and headed for my doghouse. I didn't have to go all the way. Little Ann met me on the porch. I asked her where old Dan was and called his name, and he was nowhere around. Little Ann started acting strangely. She whined and started toward the river bottoms. She ran out to the gate and came back and reared up on me. Mom and Papa came out on the porch. He's not here, I said. I think he's gone back to the tree. I don't think he'd do that, would he? Mama said. Maybe he's around someplace. Have you looked in the doghouse? I ran and looked, and he wasn't there. Everybody be quiet and listen, I said. I walked out beyond the gate a little ways and whooped as loud as I could. My voice rang like a bell on the still, frosty morning. Before the echo had died away, the deep, Oh! of old Dan rolled out of the river bottoms. He's there, I said. He wanted to make sure that coon stayed in the tree. You see, Mama? Why, I have to get that coon. I can't let him down. Well, I never in all my life, she said. I had no idea a dog loved to hunt that much. Yes, Billy, I can see now. I, I want you to get him. I don't care if you have to cut it down every tree in those bottoms. I want you to get that coon for those dogs. I'm going to get him, Mama, I said. And I'm going to get him today if I possibly can. <laughs> Papa laughed and said, Looks like there wasn't any use in building that scarecrow. All you had to do was tell old Dan to stay and watch the tree. I left the house in a run. Now and then I would stop and whoop. Each time I was answered by the deep voice of old Dan. Little Ann ran ahead of me, but by the time I reached the big tree, their voices were making the bottoms ring. When I came tearing out of the underbrush, old Dan threw a fit. He tried to climb the sycamore. He would back way off, bawling and running as fast as he could, and he would claw his way far up on its side. Little Ann, not to be outdone, reared up and placed her front, small front paws on the smooth white bark. She told the ring-tailed coon that she knew he was there. After they had quieted down, I called old Dan to me. I'm proud of you, boy, I said. It takes a good dog to stay with a tree all night, but there wasn't any need for you to come back. The coon wouldn't have gotten away. That's why we built the scale, scarecrow. Little Ann came over and started rolling in the leaves. The way I was feeling toward her, I could, couldn't even smile at her playful mood. Of course you feel good, I said in an irritated voice. 
And it's no wonder you had a good night's sleep in a nice warm doghouse, but old Dan didn't. He was down here in the cold all by himself watching the tree. The way you're acting, I don't believe you care if the coon gets away or not. I would have said more, but just then I noticed something. I walked over for a better look. There, scratched deep in the soft leaves, were two little beds. One was smaller than the other. Looking at little Ann, I read the answer in her warm gray eyes. Old Dan hadn't been alone when he got, had gone back to the tree. <coughs> she, too, had gone along. There was no doubt that in the early morning she had come home to get me. There was a lump in my throat as I said, I'm sorry, little girl. I should have known. The first half hour was torture. At each swing of the axe, my arms felt like they were being torn from their sockets. I gritted my teeth and kept hacking away. My body felt like it did the time my sister rolled me down the hill in a barrel. As Papa had said, in a little while, the warm heat from the hard work limbered me up. I remembered what my father did when he was swinging an axe. At the completion of each swing, he always said, Ha! I tried it. Kerwam. Ha! Kerwam. Ha! I don't know if it helped or not, but I was willing to try anything I could to hurry the job. Several times before noon, I had to stop and rake my chips out of the way, and I noticed that there weren't even big, even solid chips like my father had made when he was chopping. They were small and seemed to crumble up and come to all pieces. Neither were the cuts neat and even. They were ragged and looked more like work of beavers. But I wasn't interested in any beautiful tree chopping. All I wanted to hear was the big sycamore start popping. Along in the middle of the afternoon, I felt a stinging in my, one of my hands. When I saw it was blister, I almost cried. At first, there was only one, then two. Another, one after another, they rose up on my hands like small white marbles. They filled up and turned a pale pinkish color. When one would burst, it was all I could do to keep from screaming. I tore my handkerchief in half and wrapped my hands. This helped for a while, but when the cloth began to stick to the raw flesh, I knew it was the end. <laughs> Crying my heart out, I called my dogs to me and showed them my hands. I can't do it, I said. I've tried, but I just can't cut it down. I can't hold the axe any longer. Little Ann whined and started licking my sore hands. Old Dan seemed to understand, and he showed his sympathy by nuzzling me with his head. Broken-hearted, I started for home. As I turned from the corner of my eye, I saw Grandpa Scarecrow. It seemed to be laughing at me. I looked over to the big sycamore. It lacked so little being cut down. A small wedge of wood, solid wood was all that was holding it up. I let my eyes follow the smooth white trunk up to the huge spreading limbs. Sobbing, I said, You think you've won, but you haven't. Although I can't get the coon, neither can you live, because I have cut off your breath of life. And then I thought, Why well, kill a big tree and not accomplish anything? I began to feel bad. Kneeling down between my dogs, I cried and prayed, Please, God, give me the strength to finish the job. I don't want to leave the big tree like that. Please help me finish the job. I was trying to rewrap my hands so I could go back to work when I heard a low droning sound. I stood up and looked around. I could still hear the noise, but couldn't locate it. I looked up. High in the top of the big sycamore, a breeze had started the limbs to swing. A shudder ran through my huge trunk. I looked over to my right at the big black gum tree. Not one limb was moving. On its branches, a few dead leaves hung silent and still. One dropped and floated lazily towards the ground. Over my left stood a large hackberry. I looked up at, to its top. It was as still as a fence post. Another gust of wind caught in the top of the big tree. It started popping and snapping. I knew it was going to fall. Grabbing my dogs by their collars, I backed off to safety. And I held my breath. The top of the big sycamore rocked and swayed. There was a loud crack that seemed to come from deep inside the heavy trunk. Fascinated, I stood and watched the giant of the bottoms. It seemed to be fighting so hard to keep standing. Several times I thought it would fall, but in a miraculous way I would pull my itself back into a perfect balance. The wind itself seemed to be angry at the big tree's stubborn resistance. It growled and moaned as it pushed harder against the wavering top. With one final grinding, creaking sigh, the big sycamore started down. It picked up momentum as the heavy weight of the overbalanced top dove from the ground. A small ash was smothered by its huge bulk, and there was a lightning-like crack and its trunk snapped. In its downward plunge, the huge limbs stripped the branches from the smaller trees. 
A log size one knife through the top of the water oak. Splintered limbs flew f- skyward and ran out over the bottoms. With a cyclone roar, the big tree crashed to the ground, and then silence settled over the bottoms. Out of the broken, twisted, tangled mass streaked a brown, furry ball. I turned my dogs loose and started screaming at the top of my lungs, Get him, Dan! Get him! In my eagerness, old Dan ran head on into a bur oak tree. He sat down and with his deep voice told the river bottoms that he'd been hurt. It was little Ann who caught the coon. I heard the ringtail squall when she grabbed him. Scared half to death, I snatched up a club and ran to her. The coon was all over her. He climbed up on her head, growling, slashing, ripping, and tearing. Yelping with pain, she shook him off and was streaked for the river. I thought surely he was going to get away. At the very edge of the river's bank, she caught him again. I was trying hard to get in a lick with my club, but couldn't for fear of hitting little Ann. Through the tears of my eyes, I saw the red, blurry form of old Dan sail into fight. He was a mad hound. His anger at the bur oak tree was taken out on that coon. They stretched old Ringy out between them and pinned him to the ground. It was savage and brutal. I could hear the dying squalls of the coon and the deep growls of old Dan, and in a short time, it was all over. With sorrow in my heart, I stood and watched while my dogs worried the lifeless body. Little Ann was satisfied first, and I tried to scold old Dan to make him stop. Carrying the coon by a hind leg, I walked back to the big tree for my axe. Before leaving for home, I stood and looked at the fallen bo- sycamore. I should have felt proud over the job I had done, but for some reason I couldn't. I knew I would miss the giant of the bottoms, for it had played a wonderful part in my life. I thought of the hours I had whiled away, staring at its beauty, and how hard it had been finding the right name for it. I'm sorry, I said. I didn't want to cut you down, but I had to. I hope you can understand. I was a proud boy as I walked along the twilight of the evening. I felt so good even my sore hands had stopped hurting. What boy wouldn't have been proud? Hadn't my little hounds treed and killed their first coon? Along about then I decided I was a full-fledged coon hunter. Nearing our house I saw the whole family had come out on the porch and my sisters came running staring wide-eyed at the dead coon. Laughing, Papa said, Well, I see you got him. I sure did, Papa, I said. I held the coon up for all to see. Mama took one look at the lifeless body and winced. Billy, she said, when I heard that big tree fall, it scared me half to death. I didn't know, but what if it had fallen on you? Oh, Mama, I said, I was safe. I backed it way off to one side. It couldn't have fallen on me. Mama just shook her head. I don't know, she said. Sometimes I wonder if all mothers have to go through this. Come on, Papa said. I'll help you skin it. While we were tacking the hide on the smokehouse wall, I asked Pop if he had noticed any wind blowing that evening. He thought a bit and said, No, I don't believe I did. I've been out all day and I'm pretty sure I haven't noticed any wind. Why did you ask? Oh, I don't know, Papa, I said. But I thought something strange happened down in the bottoms this afternoon. I'm afraid I don't understand, said Papa. What do you mean something strange happened? I told him about how my hands had gotten so sore I couldn't chop anymore. And how I'd asked for strength to finish the job. Well, what's so strange about that, he asked. I don't know, I said. But I didn't chop the big tree down. The wind blew it over. Why, that's nothing, Papa said. I've seen that happen a lot of times. It wasn't just the wind, I said. It was the way it blew. It didn't touch another tree in the bottoms. I know because I looked around. The big tree was the only one touched by the wind. Do you think God heard my prayer? Do you think he helped me? Papa looked at the ground and scratched his head. And in a sober voice, he said, Oh, I don't know, Billy. I'm afraid I can't answer that. You must remember, the big sycamore was the tallest tree in the bottoms. Maybe it was up there high enough to catch the wind where the others just couldn't. No, I'm afraid I can't help you there. You'll have to decide for yourself. It wasn't hard for me to decide. I was firmly convinced that I had been helped.